I'm not going to dwell on the state of affairs in MENA. We're all familiar with that. So my intervention will be structured around three main points, trying to address three main questions. The first one is about the Asian experience and can it be replicated in general? The second question is, can it be replicated today? And the third question is, how is this relevant for MENA? On the first point, on the general replicability of successful experiences, uh, we are talking about a bright spot in Asia, that's Korea. We have a bright spot in, in Latin America, that's Chile. And these are the exceptions to the rule. So you need two things. You need good institutions and you need good luck. Now, the probability of these two factors combining together, I would say, is very slim. So I like Professor Lee's theory and theoretical framework. It's very elegant, but to me, I worry that it is uh, a theory that would explain the exception to the rule. Because what we are not looking at is failed interventions and how did they, end, they ended up. Um, now, with regard to failed interventions, I mean, you can have bad policies or just bad luck. And I will talk about an example of or, or give the, the hypothetical situation of a country where you have good institutions, good political uh, institutions, good policy frameworks, yet you have bad luck to, due to terms of trade shocks, due to uh, geopolitics. So uh, what we have not seen or what we are undermining or underestimating really is the welfare costs of bad interventions. So my answer, my humble attempt to answer the first question is that these exp experiences are not easily uh, replicated. Now, if we put this in today's context, and that's the second question, can we replicate this experience today? Now, the nature of today's disruptive technology is very different than what was happening in the 80s, 90s, and, and, and even early 2000s. Uh, today, the whole world is talking about artificial intelligence, about uh, blockchain technology and fintech, and there are many, many uh, interests now in the, and talk about the future of jobs in general. So, the, the growth rate for technological progress is exponential and, and the time span between the, the new discoveries and new technologies getting shorter and shorter. And I think that shortens the window for uh, interventions. There's also been a changing landscape in terms of uh, firm growth and the dynamics of firm growth. Uh, in 2006, the two biggest firms were by market capitalization globally were ExxonMobil and General Electric. Today, the biggest firms are Apple and Amazon. Uh, sorry, Apple and Google. And, and you have also Amazon and Facebook lagging behind. Uh, 10 years from now, it could be something else. But what I'm trying to say is the model of focusing on the economies of scale of deliveries of products may be a bit obsolete when growth in today's economy is driven more and more by knowledge-based activities and, and, and uh, information and digital technologies. Um, I, th I don't think we understand the microeconomics of this, uh, these types of firms yet. Um, when we talk about national innovation systems, the word national now is uh, perhaps a bit also obsolete. The world is getting more and more connected. You have research centers and universities connecting players all over the globe. So I think uh, we should talk more about ecosystems and, and, and ecosystems for entrepreneurship. Uh, and the, the drivers of that uh, relate very much to the role of the state. This is where the state can help and intervene. Um, who should pick the winners, basically, or who should do targeting? Uh, policy makers or let the private sector decide? If we make the reasonable assumption that the private sector is a little bit more adaptive than government officials, then we should trust that the private sector can deliver the job once you level the playing field and allow for uh, a good ecosystem. Uh, the way it works now uh, for, let's say, venture capital funds or, or the private sector is they work hard to try and identify new and nascent technologies, provide support. But what they do is they're taking risks because they can finance 100 companies, and then you get one or two uh, big successes. Now, they can afford to do this because they're fast moving and they have the resources. When it comes to the government, uh, we cannot really make this, um, this uh, argument. Um, 
Another point that relates to that is about the, the cycle of technology, because Professor Lee talked about short and long cycles. Now, we know this in retrospect, but it's very difficult to, uh, to predict that in advance. Um, my last point is about the relevance of this experience for uh, the MENA region. Um, I, I think the initial conditions, as Professor Abdel Kela has mentioned, is just, it's just very different uh, in terms of institutions, in terms of education. Uh, we, we lack the basic infrastructure. We need to get the basics right, I think, in MENA before we can uh, attempt to uh, talk about industrial policy. Uh, my last point in this regard is avoiding industrial policy in the classical sense and again adopting some of the, the concepts that Professor Lee mentioned uh, in his, the last slides of his presentation, which is a new approach to industrial policy and that's basically uh, just providing the necessary environment to link research and industry rather than do targeting. I think targeting can be dangerous uh, just because of the fact that in today's world it's very difficult to predict where, uh, where the technological uh, curve is going. Um, so that's my last point. Uh, I'm happy, again, I leave more room for questions and answers, and perhaps we can touch upon some of these points later on. Thank you.